Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and on behalf of the Dean and Chapter of Liverpool Cathedral, a very warm welcome to you all. For this evening's panel discussion on Beyond Boundaries, a dialogue on science and faith, we first held this type of panel discussion two years ago when my colleague, uh, Professor Carsten Welsh, uh, came and chatted to me. That was a year when Liverpool was very proud to host a major particle physics and accelerator conference, the first time outside of the great laboratory we've seen behind us talking about future developments at CERN. And it was a great evening, uh, and we wanted to do it again. And this year being our centenary of our consecration, 100 years since this wonderful cathedral church has been consecrated, we decided to do it again. So it's lovely to have you here this evening. But we wanted to go further. We wanted to develop things still further. And earlier today, we held the first of what we feel that actually has been a world first of bringing in sixth form students. I still can never remember whether that's year 12 and 13. I still think in old money there. Um, sixth form students to come and study physics, to hear the latest in terms of particle physics and accelerators, to enjoy activities here within the cathedral, learn more about medical physics, my own field, and so on really. And it was tremendously uh, impressive the way that the students and the staff and the speakers all engaged together. So we're extending the boundaries in a way of what we do within the cathedral. And that's because we firmly believe and our mantra here is that the cathedral is a place of worship first and foremost is also a place of encounter and a place of encounter for lots of different events just like this one so through all of our concerts and gala dinners as well as our prayer and worship we bring people together into this wonderful space to en encounter God in unique ways for each and every one of us so we hope that that's exactly what we will do tonight you've seen a film of a major scientific development which is in the future, but not too far into the future. And there are many developments, as we've seen, in terms of space exploration and so on, which we need to discuss, which we need to have a dialogue, which we need to talk about. So hopefully this evening's discussion from both the panel members and from your own questions as well uh, will bring us all together with open hearts and open minds to listen sensitively and respectfully to each other's viewpoints. All of our viewpoints are valid. So, once more, on behalf of the Cathedral, a very warm welcome to you. And would you please put your hands together to welcome our panel and our moderator this evening, Professor Carsten Welsh. Yes, good evening and a very warm welcome also from myself. My name is Carsten Welch and I'm the head of accelerator science here at the University of Liverpool and I had a, the pleasure of co-producing the film that you have just seen about the future circular collider, a really global research project uh, that sparks imagination, I guess, and, and fascination and really shows us where we might be going in the future. Um, tonight is all about exploring boundaries of uh, looking into bridges between different um, ways of looking at the big question that drives all of us, and that is the question, why? And to go to the bottom of this question, I have a fantastic panel today, which is joining me uh, with five panelists being here tonight and two more connected online from both um, Geneva in Switzerland and Houston, Texas in the United States. And the first thing we are going to do is um, ask our panel members one by one to very briefly introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about their personal background and professional background so that you know what their perspective on tonight is. And we're going to start with Mike at the far end, if you could okay. say a few words about yourself. Lovely. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, so, uh, to enlighten you as to who that strange, funny man was that introduced and welcomed you all, my name's uh, Canon Mike Kirby. I'm a canon here at the cathedral with the title of canon scientist. My background is that I'm a physicist, and for many years I worked in the NHS as a medical physicist, radiotherapy physicist, uh, as a consultant and head of service in the Christie Hospital in Manchester and also at Royal Preston Hospital. But I'm also, uh, at the moment, a lecturer, senior lecturer at Liverpool University and an honorary lecturer at 
Manchester University in radiotherapy physics. But I'm a priest as well uh, here in the cathedral and it's uh, a pleasure to welcome people to events like this as well as primarily to take our services and to be there in a pastoral way for all and everyone in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Andy, would you please? Good evening. So <clears throat> my name's Andy Beavis. I'm a medical physicist as well. Um, we're sitting close together because we're, we're not the particle physicists. <laughs> I think everybody else is. Um, I started my professional life as a solid state physicist and um, primarily working supporting the military. Um, but then when George Bush the first, I think that's the right way to say it, made friends with the Russians, which was a great thing, uh, I needed to find something a bit more permanent and the birth of my daughter pushed me in the right direction. Uh, and I stumbled into radiotherapy physics as well, as, as, as Mike had said. And, and basically that was because my friend John uh, had to have cancer treatment at Newcastle where we were doing our PhDs together and I started finding out about this field and I thought this is, really this is where I want to be for the rest of my time. So I managed to find a job in Hull which was where my wife's from, um, so that was very handy, I made her happy, we went back to Hull. Um, and I gave myself two years and then 32 years later I'm still here, so <laughs> um, I think it's worked out. Yeah. Um, I'm currently head of medical physics in Hull, so I'm responsible for a, a large group, about 110 people, scientists, engineers, technicians, blessed with working with some of the really good quality healthcare technicians so that we look after all the patients in, in the East Riding and Humberside, basically. Um, and um, I've been really lucky in my career, I think, having gone through this. Um, I've been able to work with government advising on the strategy for radiotherapy. I've worked many places abroad, seen some fantastic places, got to know some fantastic people and made some lifelong mm. friends, uh, mm. like with Mike. Um, and so I find myself in a, a really fantastic position, I think. I've got a passion for developing new healthcare technology through the use of techno um, innovation and, and high technology, so that's the link to everybody else here, I guess. Um, and so I'm very, very passionate about we should use the, the new technology as much as we can to really advance uh, healthcare through. I also have a passion for education and training, so I I'm, I'm currently uh, do a lot of work on, in that field, and, and interestingly, at the moment working with some US government agencies to look for funding for low middle income countries because this is now my passion is to try and implement the kind of technology we have here in the UK and in America and, and the mainland of Europe across the whole world. Um, mm -hmm. Outside of this, uh, I'll finish now I promise, <laughs> outside of this I'm an ex-rugby player, I still watch a lot of rugby. Um, we probably shouldn't talk about the rugby league. I'm from Hull at the moment, so if anybody <laughs> follows rugby league, they know why I'm despondent about that. And the Six Nations is not going well, but uh, I also have a great passion for, for music. Um, obsessively, I followed Hawkwind and Motorhead. I'm sure everybody's far <laughs> too sensible here to understand that. Um, and then recently, I've, I've become a very, very enthusiastic grandy. I, I don't think I'm ready to identify yet as a granddad, but my daughter had a beautiful granddaughter, uh, beautiful daughter recently, and, and you know that's been something which is filling our lives beautifully at the moment. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you. Um, over to Kate. Um, hi, everybody. So I'm Kate Shaw. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Sussex, and I also work at the ICTP, which is a centre that looks at physics in the global south. Um, and I work on the ATLAS experiment at CERN, so I'm an, a particle physicist and I do experimental. Um, and I'm interested in what the universe is made out of. Um, I also am very interested in inclusion and outreach. And one of the projects I work on is called Physics Without Frontiers. And we work, uh, just similar to Andy, to uh, support students and scientists in the global south in physics and to go on to further study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Andrew. Good evening. My name is Andrew Pinsent. Um, I'm a former physicist on the Large Electron-Positron Collider, the predecessor of the Large Hadron Collider, which is now operational at CERN. I'm not sure I've got any famous uh, claim to fame from this, but I was there when they, start, when they invented the internet. <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't know that, I don't know if that's come out today, but uh, the internet started at CERN mm -hmm. by uh, physics documents being connected together. 
And then suddenly the whole world was using it uh, in the space of about three or four years. I remember there was a very famous guru um, in, the, in the tech world who's still alive today. He said, the internet will never be important. <laughs> so don't trust the experts. Um, I'm now a Roman Catholic priest. I work in the Faculty of Theology at Oxford. I work in um, a unit specializing in science and religion issues. And my students come from all over the world. Thank you very much. Alex. Thank you. So my name is Alex Bainbridge. Uh, I'm the baby of the panel. Uh, I graduated with an MPhys degree in physics in 2011 and then with a PhD in experimental physics in 2015. And since then I've been working at Darsby Laboratory, which is just down the road from here. Uh, and I uh, work on mostly the actual design and construction of particle accelerators. So we've got uh, the medical side of things, the users of the accelerators, the particle physicists who look at the results, and my job is much more in the actual how to put the machines together side of things. So I've been working uh, on that since 2015. Alongside that, one of my big passions is science outreach. And since 2017, I have been uh, the Accelerator Science Department's uh, outreach liaison at Darsbury. So that's involved doing a lot of outreach events to the general public about accelerator science, and particularly to school children. Uh, and that creates uh, some quite interesting uh, dynamics. So I'm not personally religious, but the dynamic between non-religious and religious people is something that you have to take into account on outreach events, and it's something which uh, I'm looking forward to uh, exploring more today. Thank you very much. And from Liverpool Cathedral, we move overseas to Elaine. Um, my name is Elaine Howard Eklund, and I am uh, hold the um, Autry Chair in Social Sciences at Rice University, which is in Houston, Texas. Um, I am a sociologist, and so my contribution to this panel is more from someone who is not a physicist, but who studies physicists, if that makes sense. And I have done with my team at Rice um, about 40,000 surveys over the past uh, 15 years, um, looking at physicists and comparing um, their attitudes to chemists and to biologists, and specifically around issues related to um, attitudes towards religion and religious people and attitudes towards spirituality, um, the extent to which scientists think that uh, religion and science can, uh, can communicate with one another, help one another, the extent to which they are in conflict and have very, very strong borders. And so that work has been a lot of fun. Um, it's taken me all over the world. Um, our team has studied scientists in uh, nine different nations at this point. Um, but like some of those on the panel, I am also very passionate about science outreach. Um, as well in particular as inequality in science. So our team has also written articles about gender disparities um, in particular fields and subfields of science. Um, uh, we have written articles about um, immigrants in science as well as ethnic and racial minorities in science. And so these kinds of identities also often overlap with religious identities. And so uh, in terms of outreach, we've spent quite a bit of time trying to connect with uh, religious organizations and particularly um, churches, uh, which in the American uh, Southern United States, um, sometimes the congregations are, are not particularly friendly towards scientists and science. And so I've been able to take teams of scientists into religious organizations and help with dialogue and things like that. So it's so really pleased uh, to be on this panel uh, this really this esteemed panel. I'm um, looking forward to getting to know all of you better. Thank you very much, Elaine. And, and last and certainly not least, and you may have recognized him from the film just shown before, we have John Ellis, uh, who is based in Geneva tonight. Yes, uh, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back uh, virtually in Liverpool Cathedral. Thanks for the invitation to join this panel and uh, participate in this discussion. So, uh, yeah, I'm a theoretical physicist. Uh, so I don't actually do experiments myself, but um, Mrs. Thatcher once came to CERN and uh, she was introduced to me and she said, well, young man, uh, because I was then, uh, what, what do you do? So I said, well, I'm a theoretical physicist. I uh, think of things for the experiments to look for and I kind of hope they find something different. And uh, Mrs. Thatcher, of course, 
liked things to be the way that she liked them to be, so she said, wouldn't it be better if they found what she predicted? <laughs> and uh, well, I think the answer is, you know, we're always looking for clues for what lies beyond, and so uh, that's where discovering something that you weren't expecting comes in. So uh, during my career, I think I've worked quite closely with experiment. In fact, now I even uh, started participating uh, virtually in, in a couple of experiments that won't allow me anywhere near the equipment, of course. Uh, so, so why do I do this? So uh, when I was a student, I visited Boston and I saw this painting by uh, Gauguin, Paul Gauguin. Uh, what are we? Where do we come from? And where are we going? And uh, those, I think, are the, the topics of my research, uh, ranging from uh, particle physics, so uh, that's the what are we question, and uh, also astrophysics and cosmology, that's where do we come from and where are we going questions. So uh, I think many of the things that I work on obviously you know, have a connection to religion, uh, so I'd be uh, interested to see what comes out of today's panel discussion. Thank you very much, John, and, and everybody. And I, I hope you all agree that this is really a fascinating and diverse panel, and I'm sure that their diverse background will help um, our discussion tonight. As Mike said, at the very uh, start, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions, so maybe start thinking about these now. We will hand out a microphone a little bit later, and then you can address uh, the panel also directly. Um, to start things off, um, John, I would actually like to, to start with you and, uh, and follow up on what you just said. Um, as a theoretical physicist, how do you view that particular relationship between the laws of the universe that physics tries to explore and the concepts of a creator? Okay, well, I, I have to fess up straight away that uh, the, the creator does not play a role in my, uh, in my thinking. Uh, I certainly not... Uh, uh, so don't reject people who do find uh, belief in a creator uh, useful to them, but I'm afraid I'm, I, I'm not one of them. Um, so, so my life's work has basically been uh, directed towards trying to use a scientific method to understand as much as possible uh, what we can about the universe, as I said, three go-gang questions. But, but uh, I accept the fact that Whereas science, I think, can uh, answer questions like uh, what, when, where, and how, it, it cannot answer the why question. And uh, so I respect people who make it their uh, life's work to explore the, the why question. And uh, I think that uh, it's in, in parallel to what we as scientists, as physicists, specifically as particle physicists do, in, in trying to uh, answer the other questions. I, I don't know whether that's the sort of uh, thing that you wanted to know. Yeah, I think it's a very good start into the discussion and I would like to follow up um, directly with, with Mike, um, who also has this interesting relationship between science and faith basically mm -hmm. on a daily basis. How do you personally reconcile that interface? Well, I can equate with a, with a lot of what John has just mentioned, really. As a scientist myself, I'm looking for those, those, those answers using, using experiments, using our theory, and particularly for, for, for my science of looking towards how we can use those for helping human beings, particularly those suffering from cancer, really. So. But the other side, as John mentioned, really, that various aspects of our science can't answer, aren't there, and not prepared to be able to answer certain questions of meaning within life, really. And that's where my faith comes in very, very strongly, and where it is a, a real complement to the empirical side, to the scientific side. They're, they're ways of looking at the, the whole of humanity, the whole of creation in a much wider sense. I do believe in a creator, uh, and uh, within my, my prayer and worship life, Within our faith, we are often described, we may be described as being made in the image of God, or in the image of a creator. And I often, in my, my own uh, simple physicist brain, uh, uh, imagine God as being that uh, inquisitive person that 
we all are as scientists, as, as we all are within our humanity, looking for answers, looking at the things in the world around us, really. And maybe with that same inquisitiveness that God had in terms of creating our wonderful world and in creating our universe, that's the inquisitiveness and the curiosity that we have as scientists as well. So in a way, I can feel the balance between that. I've, I can openly say that I've never had a tension between those two. Uh, the two, for me, are very much uh, intermeshed with one another on a daily basis. Really, really. Yeah, maybe, maybe directly digging deeper into that aspect of the interface between physics and, and science. Andrew, you mentioned your own personal past as a, um, theory, as a particle physicist at the Large Electron Positron Collider first, and, and then uh, the, the, the career that you have made um, afterwards. How has your background in particle physics, if at all, influenced your philosophical and theological views? on the existence and nature of God? Well, I begin by saying, I think it's amazing we do a science at all. Um, uh, um, the, the owl, think about the owl, has much better sight than we have, but owls do not do astronomy. Um, they, they, they use their eyesight just to look for small um, prey on the forest floor. Um, so the very fact we do science is weird to me, uh, and you're right, if we made the image of God, God's weird. Um, <laughs> And also, the other thing about God, I learned from particle physics, is if there's a God, let's treat it as a hypothesis, um, then God is not restricted to three dimensions. And what I've kept coming up, um, in the, uh, coming up against in the theory of particle physics was how things often look better if you, if you just happen to think in four dimensions or 11 dimensions or whatever. <laughs> so um, it certainly expands the mind, and that's a good thing. It doesn't lead directly to God, I think, but it gives a sense of awe, and um, it does help prepare the mind in certain ways uh, to tackle theology as well. Th thank you. Maybe, maybe trying to bring these three positions together and combining it with some solid data. Um, Elaine, in your research, um, and, and based on the data that's available to you, you mentioned studies across uh, many different countries. How do scientists' personal face affect their approach to scientific research and discovery? Thank you. I was really um, leaning into these previous answers, which were uh, really beautiful and uh, definitely answers that I found more widely among the scientists that I have worked with through my studies. So one area that is consistent for um, disciplines of science, as well as across national contexts, is the idea of awe and beauty. It's not that um, we struggle to experience awe and beauty without God, but it is the case that many scientists, even scientists at a fairly high level, do draw a sense of awe or a sense of feeling that their scientific work is beautiful from some sort of religious or faith background. So I would say that's a chief way that scientists uh, bring um, their faiths to bear on scientific work itself is through that sense of something beyond the self, um, that sense of awe and wonder and beauty. Um, the other way, a second way that scientists often bring faith to their scientific work is through their ethical approaches to science. So um, science scientists uh, that we have interviewed would say that science does not give them, does not necessarily give them an ethical approach to their scientific work, that they need to go outside of the scientific enterprise itself um, to get some kind of ethical framework for their scientific work. And they often, even if they're not personally religious in the, in the current time, they draw on a religious past um, when I interviewed um, and surveyed UK scientists, for example, from across, across the, the context, they often brought in um, a sensibility from their upbringing um, in the Anglican church, or if they're Muslim for their upbringing um, in studies of Islam. And they often brought that to bear on their scientific work. So even things like deciding what, um, what organizations they would take funding from, um, deciding how much effort that they would put into outreach um, to marginalized communities about science, so things like that. Often a part of their ethical framework for all of science came from some kind of faith tradition. 
And then um, a last way that religion often comes up for scientists is in their interaction with religious people. So across the nations that I studied, there were sometimes minority religious groups and sometimes majority religious groups who sometimes were suspicious of scientists, who had concerns about science, and often scientists use their own interactions from their own religious background to help them relate to religious people and really to advance science and scientific work within the context of religious communities. So, so really those three ways through that sense of awe and beauty, um, through their ethical approaches to science and through their interactions with religious people, those were the three chief ways that religion comes up in the, in the course of scientific work. Thanks, thanks a lot, Elaine. Um, so we, we, we've, we've talked a lot about um, that interface between science, religion, um, how that affects um, personal, professional growth. I think I'd like to expand this now um, into an area that Elaine just mentioned, a scientific outreach, uh, something that a lot of scientists are doing. And Kate, you have been very active in this area for many years, and uh, as you said in your introduction, also in many different parts of the world. Um, in this work, how do you address that interface between science and religion, in particular maybe with young students? Yeah, so we've done a lot of outreach on particle physics and all types of physics, actually, all over the world. Um, and we also work in some conservative areas, some religious uh, conservative areas. And sometimes we've been worried about talking about science, especially when it comes to fundamental physics, when we're talking about elements like the Big Bang, the fundamental particles that were created at this moment. Um, and yeah, at the beginning, we were worried about how to go about that. Um, but through our experience working in international collaborations, such as at CERN, um, all the people I know that are religious have never had a kind of uh, conflict between uh, the religious side of their understanding and the scientific side of their understanding. As Mike was discussing mm -hmm. before, everyone I've spoken to, is always, they've always come across it as it's a complementary aspect and we found that there was no problems in discussing elements about the moment of creation or big bangs. Even in conservative areas, for example, we worked a lot in the Middle East and Palestine and Jordan, Afghanistan, Iraq. Um, some of these places are very conservative and in society. Um, but the scientists, it's uh, wonderful actually working across the world because you really see science as this unifying idea, no matter where you go. If you're speaking with students in Chile or in Afghanistan or in Canada, we're all speaking the same language and we're all interested in the same thing. So it really builds these bridges. Um, and one of the most interesting things I saw, well, one of the things that really touched me, uh, was in the Kurdistan region of Iraq in the, in the north, in Suleimania. Um, and one of the students there, so she's a, a doing physics undergraduate, at the end of our two-week uh, course, so we're working with uh, Kurdistan physicists from uh, Italy and from the UK, um, and she painted me a picture, and it said on it, um, well, first of all, it had Maxwell's equations on it, so the scientists will know Maxwell's equations, there's four of them, they're relatively simple, you can write them quite quickly, and they explain electromagnetism, so electric and magnetic currents. And there's just four of them. And this uh, picture had kind of a sky on the background, and it said, uh, and God said, and then it had these four <laughs> equations, and there was light. So of course, um, these electromagnetic uh, equations are what uh, make light propagate. And I just thought that was really beautiful. Um, the way that religion is so ingrained in their everyday life and everything they think about um, in such a way that it intersects with physics in that way. And I've still got that picture now in my office, so I've always really loved it. Wonderful. Um, Andrew, I think you had I a must comment. just make a comment about the Big Bang Theory. It was invented by a priest, Father <laughs> George Lemaitre, in 1927. So uh, I've, um, that's often a fact that surprises our school children, uh, that a priest invented the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> I didn't know that. Thanks. Perhaps I, perhaps John, I please, yes. Sure, in here, Catherine, the Catherine, if I may. So the laws of physics, as we understand them, describe things that happened after the Big Bang. But we cannot yes. go back to time equal to zero within right. our current yes. physical framework. And uh, so I think that's a very sort of a simple way of saying that uh, science and unscience, if I can call it that way, can coexist. There are problems that you know, we just can't answer, 
and like what actually happened at the moment of the Big Bang itself. And uh, so that's an open space for religion. Abs absolutely. Um, before coming back to Elaine and more data maybe on that intersection between science and religion, Alex, um, you also mentioned before that you have done a lot of outreach, a lot of community engagement work. Uh, you also said that uh, you don't have any particular uh, face and that you are an artist. I think that brings up an interesting question directly connected with what Kate was saying. Um, what strategy should uh, scientists, do you think, employ when they engage with religious communities when it comes to more challenging topics, the, the grand challenges of today, such as climate change, artificial, artificial intelligence research? Um, is there a particular approach that you think is useful? I think there's, uh, got a, there's quite a deep question. There's one of the most effective things is to never make it purely about religion. It's always much larger than just atheism versus religion. And that doesn't mean that you have to exclude religion. And when we do outreach at my lab, we, we don't generally bring religion into it unless someone else brings it into it first. And part of that is because it can create a very challenging environment. And part of that is because my lab is public sector and we have to be seen to be religiously neutral and be, be careful with that. But I think the key thing is that when you get uh, a scientist, especially a non-religious scientist uh, and a religious person into a dialogue, is to start with looking for areas of common ground and you can generally find them because it's not just, I say, it's never just about religion. So sometimes it's best to accept that religion is not going to be one of those areas of common ground not necessarily pursue it, there's no point getting into that debate, neither is going to convert the other, that's not the objective. The thing that is with common areas, so you mentioned artificial intelligence or genetic engineering, again, it's larger than religion, it's not just uh, religious people who have concerns about these areas, lots of atheists and, uh, and non-religious people have concerns uh, as well, so it's a complex moral and ethical topic beyond uh, what any one religion might particularly say. I mean, people take their morals and ethics from a lot of different areas and backgrounds. Some religious people might take their morals and ethics from the Bible or the Quran, and some people, that morals and ethics come from the way they were raised, or just a general sense of empathy or general con concern. So you can use those uh, combined uh, agreements on, where, on, on these issues to start with an agreement and then move from that agreement then into the more diverging areas. And that way you start the debate with a more open and friendly tone and that leads to a more amicable debate in general where you can actually have constructive discussions rather than it sort of starting out as diametrically opposed. So uh, yeah, I think if you, need, you do need to preserve a degree of scientific integrity in this as a scientist. So. It's important to be open to what other people are saying to you, but at the same time, not to blindly accept it without them being able to back it up with something. And similarly, never to expect anyone else to blindly accept what you're saying, unless you can back it up with a lot as well. And that's not always trivial. Uh, it's, sometimes it's impossible. We've heard uh, already about the, the statement of science can answer the, uh, the, the how, the what, the when, but the why? It's, it, you can't quantify the why with data most of the time. Mike? Yeah, I'd like to add something in, in, in complement to what Alex has just said. Uh, Andy and I, from our, our backgrounds in, in, in radiation therapy, will have come across where a common ground is that we're looking towards the health care of our patients. For some of us with a faith, like myself, I feel that's very much a calling of mine to be working in that field and to be using my science in that particular way. But a common ground for others with other faiths or no faiths is there with the health and care of our patients. So we have a common way and a platform for us to move forward with our scientific develop developments as far as our patients are concerned. So I think there are elements of those common grounds that we can find in many different um, faculties, not just the scientific one as well, really. So. Yeah, very, very, very interesting. I mean, definitely lots of um, different, diverse views already in our panel, um, which have um, various backgrounds, and I'm sure we have many more opinions also here in the audience. So what we see is that uh, these uh, backgrounds can influence um, quite strongly how we 
how we look at the same fundamental question. And uh, Alex, I absolutely with, agree with you that these questions are challenging and there isn't uh, just one answer. Um, Elaine, now back to you and, and, and your studies. How do you um, find that attitudes towards that intersection of science and religion vary or differ between different cultures and societies? Um, I, I do want to answer that. Uh, if I could comment just a little bit on the outreach, would that be all right? Just Please, in response yeah, absolutely. To, that, to what um, these others have said, I want to bring a little bit of data to it. So we have found in science communication studies that finding common ground um, between religious and scientific communities really does work um, in terms of changing, of sometimes changing minds, but even more important for me, is getting groups to work together for things like better science education in the schools or things like that. And I've been surprised in our studies of the outreach processes that sometimes religious and scientific people um, have a lot in common. And we know, of course, that there are people who cross both worlds, right? Um, but for example, things like alleviating suffering, um, caring for the earth, um, these are common, wanting an ethical approach to science and how we do science. These are things that scientific and certain kinds of religious communities often have um, in common. And another thing that we have found is that it's extremely important when you set up dialogue between religious communities and scientific communities to choose people with equal levels of education um, and prestige. Sometimes you see these dialogues and they're kind of cooked where a, um, they will have a very prestigious scientist and a religious person who has much less education or much less exposure to science. And so you want to include sort of equal educational status. That's is very, very important as well. So everyone feels like um, their voice is represented appropriately. So just wanted to, to say that. So there, there is difference um, among societies that we've studied in how general population people and scientists themselves view the science and faith interface. So a couple of things I wanted to bring to the discussion. Um, societies have very different proportions of religious people and very different um, dominant religious traditions. So when I was in the UK interviewing scientists, most of the conversation related to religion and science was science and relationship to the Anglican church. Um, it, to a lesser extent, um, scientists talked about um, immigrant Muslims and their impact on science, but mostly in relationship to that particular church understanding. Um, in Turkey, of course, we have a very different dominant religion. And so it's very important to take into account the dominant religion that will shape um, the dialogue or lack of dialogue. The other thing that's very important is the relationship the religious tradition has to the state and to science itself. So um, some scientists in uh, the UK that I interviewed thought that the Anglican church had been extremely friendly to science, although they didn't think that the church was very powerful in society, so they didn't really much care about the church, but they didn't think that the church was a problem. They had much greater concern with religious minority groups um, like immigrant Muslims and very concerned about the impact that Islam might have on science. And so there is, there's real difference among national contexts. There's also um, a difference in the content of religion. So when we studied scientists in Taiwan, for example, which is a very religiously diverse society, the idea of there being any kind of conflict um, between religion and science or religious communities and scientists was almost a foreign idea to them. Um, they thought that science and religion um, across a variety of traditions of um, Protestants and members of folk religion and Buddhism were present among the scientists we interviewed. They did not think that there was any kind of conflict between religion and science um, because they had been taught how to live well with a religious pluralism. So to really take into account the differences among national contexts and the content of religion and how that frames um, the science and religion interface. Thank you, Elaine. Um, maybe going back now to the very beginning of this evening and the opening film, The, the Future Circular Collider, uh, a 100 kilometer atom smasher as a grand vision for particle physics. So that's a machine which 
maybe build over the next decades, which has an experimental program that goes all the way probably to the end of this century. Uh, so that's a grand vision. Um, John, as a, as a particle physicist, um, what can we hope to gain from such a discovery machine? Well, I think we can uh, hope to uh, understand uh, nature at the next level beyond what we've achieved with our experiments so far, the standard model, uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson and so on. And uh, when I'm giving general talks about this, I often uh, take as one of my texts a poem by T.S. Eliot, uh, Little Gidding. And uh, he wrote in that, to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. And, and I think that's very much where we are with particle physics at the moment. We've uh, completed the construction of what we call the standard model that describes all the visible stuff in the universe. Uh, but, for example, um, we know there's a lot of invisible stuff. Uh, there's dark matter, there's, there's dark energy. Uh, I mentioned the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is a really mysterious particle which poses all sorts of puzzles. Uh, why does it have the mass that it does? Why do the different particles which get their masses from the Higgs boson have such different masses? Um, how did the universe get to be so uh, big and old? That might also have something to do with the Higgs boson. Uh, is the universe going to collapse? Uh, that's also a problem that's raised by our current understanding of the Higgs boson. So I, I think that uh, with FCC, which, which comes in different um, parts, there's a first part which would be relatively low energy but capable of doing extremely precise measurements, and a subsequent stage, gliding protons, which would be much higher energy, uh, maybe more of an exploration machine. Um, I, I think that we've got you know, great prospects for, uh, as I said, going to the next level in our understanding of, uh, of the way that the universe is constructed. Uh, if I could come back to a remark that I uh, made earlier on, you know, our, our laws of physics don't allow us to say what happens, what happened at the Big Bang. But by going to experiments at higher, higher energies, we can get closer to the Big Bang. And uh, the LHC got us, let's say, 10 times further than we were previously. And the FCC will take us another factor of 10 closer. But it will still be the mystery of the Big Bang. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, John. Maybe, uh, Kate, you as another particle physicist, the same question really. Where do you see a machine like the future circular collider, so a next generation atom smasher? Where could it take us? What, what, what hope could we, what, what kind of answers could we hope to get from such a discovery machine? Yeah, so the FCC might lead us in particle physics for the next century. It's a really exciting idea and a really exciting project. Um, and, I mean, I could echo everything that John just said. It could lead us into many new areas of physics. And uh, one of the most exciting things, of course, is discovering something we've never made before. Um, sorry, discovering something we've never, we've never thought of before. You know, we're trying to answer what's dark matter, what's dark energy, why is there more matter than antimatter? But uh, when you have discovery machines at this scale, you really can start going into um, new regimes, new eras that you've never thought of before. There was no prediction for special relativity and understanding what happens when you go at the speed of light before um, Einstein started to work on that. So every step of the way in the discovery is really exciting. But I think the, the second part of what's exciting with the FCC is that just allows us to continue having this international center, such as CERN, where scientists from all over the world, it's really an international collaboration based in, in Geneva, um, all that training and all that continuous um, inspiration to students worldwide, I think that's really going to be the benefit that we, we grasp. Obviously, it's always exciting to learn more about physics, and I know we always will do, but having this international centre that is invested in education students and invested in that training to allow students from every corner in the world to continue their journeys of discovery, I think that's, you know, that's the real benefit we're going to reap. 
So re really interesting points here. So we, we, we hear that such a world collider, as I may call it, brings together the global scientific community and is driven by a research vision which is ultimately motivated by the question why, why is the world around us the way it is, um, and that really drives scientific and technological progress. So I guess much closer to, to, to many of us um, than these large particle physics-based questions are the medical applications that Mike and, and Andy both you mentioned. And, and Andy, for, for, for you personally, what role do you see that spirituality in general can take or should take in the healthcare setting, both for patients and the healthcare professionals? Well, I think it's a, a very interesting question. And, and of course, we've already heard what spirituality means, religious, non-religious, um, defined by people individually, whatever. But let me, let me just go off on a slight tangent to start with, and I'll draw it back, I promise. Um, so a couple of friends of mine who worked, used to work in our department, they're both now retired, um, clinical psychologists. So we had an interesting group in our clinic uh, where we had clinical psychology available to all our patients and staff, actually. But Leslie Walker did some really interesting research where using vis visual therapy um, to promote positive thinking, he showed that actually you could affect the treatment that patients were getting or that the patients could affect their own treatment. So what, what he did was he got people to think about something which helped them be positive about the treatment they were having. So some of them and one, this is, this is real, I promise you this is real. One of them came up with a, a drawing of Corporal Jones because the cancer cells don't like it up on, don't like it up on. And, and this worked perfectly for this, this guy um, because he said, well, you know, now I'm thinking that the, the therapy's working. Um, there was another one which, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I will. Um, so Leslie said to, to a lady, well, what about, if you can't think of anything, what about thinking of doing the ironing? She said, oh no, 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 no. That's what I'm gonna do when I go home, which I've got to do. I want to do something else, <laughs> think about something else. So, you know, different things work for different people. Um, but the, the scientific point here is that in a study that was done, and, and we have ways of measuring whether these differences are real or not, using statistics, <coughs> um, looked at the results that they had and found that there was significantly higher T cell production in patients who use this vi positive visual therapy. So to bring it round now, you know, if that was spirit, uh, spirituality or if that was religion that, that um, people were using as their positive way of thinking about it, well, fantastic, you know, that's, that, that was absolutely, um, you know, positive. And I think Mike and I were talking about this the other day and Mike reminded me that actually there was a study done with Estro, yes, um, which Two looked at the same thing, but from a religious point of view mm -hmm. and how did people use their religion in, in guiding their, themselves through their treatment. So for the professionals, well, I, I thought long and hard about this actually, that, you know, we, we've all faced difficult cases, difficult to deal with cases. Sometimes it's one person and it all resonate with you for some reason because you come across a patient, they're the same age, they've got the same number of kids as you, they've had this cough and, well, we had COVID and I had this cough for six months and, and you know, you start thinking everything goes through your mind or for some of my colleagues, I've seen it when people have been very strong through the whole of their career, five, 10 years, whatever, and then all of a sudden, there's just a cascade of events happen and, and they find it very difficult. So I think, you know, whatever, however you define spirituality, you know, you, everybody uses something like this in order to, to deal in, in the professional sense as a coping mechanism. Now it might be their religion. It might be just because they, you know, they have their own ways of meditating and thinking about it. And I just feel that However you deal with it, how you've, however you define it, it's such an important role in helping us go through and seeing these difficult things. I mean, you know, you have to remember, virtually everybody I see in the clinic every day has got cancer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you don't deal with it well, it, it can become a problem. So I, I think the, the last thing I was going to say on this was that how does this jive in modern healthcare? Well, we're public servants. We, we, we're... I'm cynical, I'm saying we're programmed these days to think about inclusivity and, and think about diversity, but you know, we're not. We, this has just become part of what we do. So is it important and how do we deal with it? Well, I think whatever your own beliefs are, whatever your own thoughts are, 
in the modern healthcare system, I do truly believe that everybody's thoughts and everybody's own approach is, is brought into it and, and we will, you know, if, if religion is important to somebody and they tell us that in the clinic, well then that will be brought into, into the daily routine, if you like, and, and we'll, we'll look after people. Yes, I think I would like to, to look at this question of uh, scientific technical advancement in a medical setting in your in your case um, and like to follow up with Andrew on um, on this uh, when we look at technical advancements um, what do you think how can religion contribute to the development of ethical guidelines of how these technologies should be used I think there are a few areas one of which is to, to defend the pursuit of immaterial goods um, Big scientific projects are sold to governments on the basis of producing material benefits. But actually, that's not really why we do science. We do science for immaterial reasons. Um, you know, I used the example at the beginning of the, the owl. The owl can see better than we can, but the owl did not it, did develop astronomy. Uh, it's a very human accomplishment. And um, in strictly material societies, with no sense of the transcendent, science suffers. Science suffered in communist China in the Cultural Revolution. Pure mathematicians were enemies of the people because they consumed food without producing any goods. So um, def the defense of immaterial goods is one area. The second area is a, a sense of transcendent truth. You may all know Google has suffered a massive um, crisis the last few weeks because their AI produces things that are not true, um, but they do conform with the prejudices of the programmers. And um, so Google's suffered a $15 billion stock loss, uh, and there's been a massive um, crisis about this. Um, we've got to have a sense of tr a transcendent se a sense of truth, not just a pragmatic sense of truth. And I think we have in science inherited that, partly from our religious past, but there's a danger with that's dying away. That's what's happened with Google recently. So we have to find a way of defending a transcendent notion of truth. Uh, truth as it is, not just because it's convenient. Um, I think the other, the other area is the sense of the unity of the world. And the, the, there is a kind of gamble in what we do, even with this big FCC project, um, that there's, there's order to be discovered. Um, where that sense comes from, I think there's complex roots. But I think there's partly a religious enterprise that we're carrying on uh, in many ways. So I think there are three ways in which faith interacts with science in ways that are perhaps not obvious to people, but they're there. Yeah, I would like to pick up on one uh, statement you just made, which I found very interesting. You said that scientists often have to sell to governments um, the material benefits of a particular project that they wish to realize um, and connect and bring, bring John into this because what John said as motivation for a discovery <coughs> machine, a collider, was exactly the opposite. It was not the immediate material benefit. It was really the, the driving question, um, why? Um, why is the world around us what it is? How can we understand nature and all of its facets better? Uh, so John, I think I would, would like to bring you in into the question that I just asked to Andrew and also in the same context ask you when the Higgs boson was discovered um, it was named by popular media as the God particle was that a misdirection was that wrong branding what's your view on this I think it was terribly wrong branding <laughs> and, uh, well there's a story for how the God particle uh, moniker got applied to the Higgs boson which uh, has to do with trying to sell a book, but uh, anyway. Uh, no, I, I think it's uh, really a, a total uh, misnomer. I mean, I, as I said, uh, the Higgs boson is, is a very fascinating particle. It's a very mysterious particle, uh, but uh, you know, it's just a particle like all the others. It's not, uh, it's, it's not a god. Um, it does give uh, things uh, mass, John. Sorry? It's an old joke. Uh, it does give things mass, so I'd say it's a Catholic god of art. <laughs> <laughs> Some things mass. Sorry, old joke, old joke. Yeah. Right, thank, uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, finally... <laughs> the, yeah. Also tell a joke, which actually isn't a joke, it's, it's a science fiction story. So, uh, 
this uh, civilization links together all the computers on all the different oh, planets yeah. <laughs> and they make the final connection. And then the uh, designer of the system steps up to the uh, voice interface and uh, asks the question, is there a God? And uh, there's a flash of light, uh, a loud noise. Uh, the designer is struck down and the voice says, there is now. <laughs> I think this uh, ties in very uh, neatly with uh, what Andrew was just saying about Google. <laughs> right, before, turning question to, 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 before turning to questions from the audience, uh, just one final question to, um, I think, both Kate and Elaine. Um, I think it's still true today that very often scientists work alone or in small groups. In particle physics, uh, accelerator science, certainly for a global project like the Future Circular Collider, that is simply impossible. It needs the world to work together. Does that generate a sense of community and belonging rather than competition? Kate, maybe first, and then Elaine? Yeah, so I've always worked uh, on big experiments since I since actually I did my dissertation back here in Liverpool about 20 years ago. So I worked on Atlas the full time. I also work on another experiment, June, that's based in the US. But we're all big collaborations and we're actually made of thousands of scientists. So we're the biggest collaborations in science in the world, uh, between one and 3,000 scientists. And we're from all over the world, from loads of different types of countries and cultures and peoples. Um, and it is really interesting because we're a slightly different type of breed, I think, to other scientists who are working maybe in more competition because they want to have, you know, the big new idea, the big new paper in, um, in the kind of physics we do. It's not really about that because it's about the community and we've all got to work together to get that data to do the analysis. And so, like anything else, everyone has to do lots of different types of jobs and some of them are more fun and get more high status than others. And I kind of, I like that because it's not about yourself. It's not individualistic. It's about the community. So you might have to spend your time reviewing papers or doing some difficult stuff with, um, with some coding that isn't very interesting in order so that you can do the big Higgs analysis at the end of the day. And so I like that sense of community and I like the sense that everyone has to do, you know, everyone has to do some washing up and some vacuuming, you know, in part, part of, you know, everything that makes a household uh, work in order to do the, the cherry on the top, the main analysis. Um, and yet yeah, I also wanted to mention that I think what I love about what we do in these big, big collaborations is it really shows what we can do as an international com community when we work together towards the common goal. So we have different scientists in different countries that don't get along politically, don't get along in any other way, but they work together awesome. and coherently towards this, this common goal. And it shows that if we actually have these common goals and we work in this kind of way, we can achieve, you know, we really have achieved so much of what we've done. And I think that should be copied in other, in other areas. Elaine, how is that supported by data? So I think empirically, um, it, it's true that um, physicists uh, in, this, uh, in these big experiments do have to work together to achieve common research goals. Um, I don't have um, recent data on science diplomacy, but there's an earlier field in science communications about science diplomacy, which argues that when scientists work together across national contexts, um, that that actually leads to uh, potentially better interactions politically um, in those national contexts. So we we see just extraordinary strife in the world now. So it's there's a collateral benefit of a physicist um, doing these big experiments. It's of course there's the science itself, which is the principal benefit, but there are collateral benefits of nations working together. Um, to solve difficult problems. I want to throw out another hypothesis, which is that I do wonder if um, particle physicists are perhaps trained or equipped um, to reach out to communities that they might disagree with. Um, so they might perhaps be better at interacting with um, religious communities that have some hostilities towards science um, because they are often trained together to work across difference for uh, common goods and common goals. I haven't actually studied that, but I do have that as a hypothesis. Right, thank you. Now coming to your questions. Um, if you would like to ask a particular panel member, um, or the panel in... John, yeah? 
could, could I just break in with something which yeah, sure. I've been itching to say for, for most yeah. of the discussion? I, I think you know one of the really uh, tragic uh, consequences of the violence that we see at the moment in Ukraine and uh, in uh, in Palestine and Israel is uh, you know, a, a breakdown in this sort of international collaboration, which not only enables us to uh, make fantastic scientific discoveries, but also, as Elaine was just saying, fosters international understanding. And I think it's a, a real tragedy that uh, the CERN Council, uh, in its uh, infinite unwisdom, uh, decided to impose scientific sanctions on uh, Russian and Belarusian scientists. Oh, gosh. They didn't know. have any say in the policy of their government. Many of them signed petitions against what their government was doing. But nevertheless, they face, uh, within a few months or so, uh, basically being banned from CERN. Oh, and uh, the uh, framework of international collaboration that uh, we've been building up over, over literally generations uh, it's just going to get broken. Uh, I could also mention the uh, question of Palestine and Israel. Uh, I, was, I was involved in trying to get Palestinian physicists involved in activities at CERN, uh, was almost 20 years ago now, at least 15 years ago. And the people who were most helpful in doing that were Israeli physicists. And so I think you know, what's going on in Gaza is also an example of you know, something which can really damage global collaboration and, and potentially make it very difficult to attend, you know, achieve the sorts of uh, global collaborative scientific goals that we've been talking about. Yeah, very important point. Thanks, John. And, and also, I think, echoing what Kate said earlier about uh, science and large scientific projects, building bridges between communities and a variety of different <laughs> backgrounds. Um, as I said, now to your questions. Um, if you would like to ask a question, simply raise your hand. We have a microphone which we will hand out. And then if there's a particular panel member that you would like to ask, um, just um, say their name and address them directly. Or if it's a general question, then the panel will uh, see who is best suited. There's a question over here. If the FCC is like, su successful in allowing us to comprehend like dark matter and dark energy, what do you think the implications of gaining that knowledge would be like, how it would impact humanity or like how it, how it would be useful? That's probably a question for Kate and John first, but if anybody else would like to chip in, by all means, feel free. Um, Kate, would you like to start? That's a really great question. That's a really hard question. I'm sure uh, John and maybe others have something um, to help answer it. Um, we don't have direct kind of impact of um, these kind of discoveries. Learning more about particle physics and fundamental physics is really just exploring more about our universe. We know so little uh, about our universe, and that's is the big problem with dark energy and dark matter, as you might know. Only 4% of the universe uh, we actually know about that's made of matter, made of uh, quarks and leptons and electrons that make up atoms. Um, so discovering this other 96% dark energy and dark matter is going to lead us to a, a big revolution in how we understand this universe. Um, the direct applications we don't know, but of course we have so many examples from the past when we first discovered the electron, of course we did not know how it would be used in all the ways it is today. Uh, and the same of course with things like quantum mechanics. Um, would you like to add something? I like to challenge the assumption that we have to do useful things. Um, so I'll quote you from Aristotle, 23 centuries ago. He said, if the Egyptian priests had not had the leisure time to do useless things, they would never have invented mathematics. <laughs> so um, that's part of our glory as human beings. We do useless things. We're in a, a fantastic building here, which has no practical use, by the way. <laughs> that's great. That's part of what is, uh, think of a, the Sistine Chapel ceiling. I mean, Beethoven's Fifth. These are not, use, these are not useful things, uh, but that's part of our glory as human beings. And we desire immaterial goods. And um, as a byproduct, we build our civilization. That's a, that's a bonus. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Uh, John, please. 
So uh, antimatter was uh, postulated by Dirac in the uh, 1920s, and it was discovered in the 1930s. And I don't think anybody imagined that it would be useful in medicine. But there was this technique, positron emission tomography, which uh, is used to diagnose uh, metabolic processes in, inside the body. And uh, to, to pick up on what Andrew said, you know, antimatter was postulated and discovered for immaterial reasons. But it turns out to have practical applications. I have no idea what you see Higgs boson is going to turn out to be. Maybe nothing, but you know, maybe. Mike. I was going to make a, a very, very similar uh, point that John has just made, really. Sometimes we, we don't know what the discovery will bring. That's one of the beauties of finding out more and more about our universe. But it does bring discoveries that we then can find uses for to some great effect. In a sense, for myself as a priest and within my own faith, I find the same thing with scripture, with the Bible itself, in that we can look into it and look deep into it and always find new things within that, even if we're reading exactly the same portion of scripture the same way. And exactly with our scientific discoveries, it will bring new things to us and bring new light in different ways that we can then, as inventive human beings, actually then begin to find other uses for. Really, so. Thanks, Mike. Other questions? There's one in the back. Okay. Oh, sorry. It's yeah. Okay, fine. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the point that was mentioned about how scientists in the UK might be worried about the. Uh, influence or the threat of Muslim communities, uh, some of whom are immigrants and some of whom are not, uh, by the way. Um, because I found that quite telling because um, actually, according to my knowledge of the Islamic tradition, um, Islam and science uh, doesn't have the same type of problematic tension, and I think one of the panelists referred to this, um, as it might have in other traditions. Um, because in the Islamic tradition, a lot of the Islamic scholars or the religious theologians, they are polymaths who also have an expertise in various sciences. And so a lot of those prominent scientists who discovered things that we still like use that knowledge today, they were also um, like Islamic clerics or clergy or you know whatever you call that. Um, so I think that um, you spoke a lot about outreach, like you know scientists like outreaching. I think what we also need to have is uh, the opposite of outreach, which is also thinking about how scientists are educated mm -hmm. about diversity and about different histories of different religions, civilizations, and cultures. Because uh, I think what that shows, that observation that there is this prejudice, is that scientists are also not always thinking scientifically, and they also have their own uh, biases and preconceived notions. That's it, thank you. Very important point. Uh, Elaine, I'm sure you wanted to comment on this. Yeah, I could not agree with the questioner more. So um, my job as a, as a social scientist, as a sociologist, um, is not to argue with my respondents, although I often did want to argue with them. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, and I, I agree with you that um, scientists know a lot about their particular fields of study and often um, I hope you won't take this the wrong way, sometimes think they know more about other areas of study than they do, and often walk around with stereotypes just like any people group. Uh, and sometimes those stereotypes are very consequential. And so in this case, and I don't want to paint too broad of a picture, it's not that all UK scientists um, spoke negatively of Muslim peoples, and there are definitely um, Muslims in science in the UK um, but this was the group that was talked about um, the most with a language of threat. And so I think that's somewhat telling and shows the need uh, for more education in the scientific community itself. So thank you for saying that. Kate. So, yes. could, could, could I? I think there was just one comment from Kate and then John. Um. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, yeah, I think that's a really important point. Um, one of the issues we have in science is uh, diversity and inclusion and one of the issues is that in in the UK and in Europe science is taught in a very Eurocentric fashion and of course um, you know much much of scientific discovery was done in the Islamic world and when I've uh, been uh, doing teaching and training in many Islamic countries they're very aware of their own history of course and they will teach it and that's very uh, important but it's not taught 
almost at all, really, in the UK and in, and in Europe. I mean, most of the medical physics, I think, was, was born in, in Iraq, as was, um, you know, lots of astronomy and many other uh, disciplines. And this is really important because it's, it excludes you if you're told that it's a European topic for European people. Uh, obviously, this had, had the same thing with uh, women and girls. They feel excluded because you're told it's, it's a male field. And by excluding other uh, cultures and religious um, contributions and being part of science, I think, is, is one of the reasons we end up with an undiverse scientific community. So I think that's a really important point to do more education within the scientific community, but also with our, scientific, with our science curriculum in schools. So we hear from John and then over to Andy. Uh, I just wanted to uh, comment that, uh, of course, one of the most uh, famous uh, theoretical physicist of the past generation was Abdus Salam, who uh, was Muslim. He came from Pakistan. He came to uh, England. He did his uh, most famous work, namely uh, proposing the standard model of particle physics uh, while affiliated with uh, Imperial College. So I think this is you know, an example that should be uh, mentioned, Elaine, to the people that you talk to who express negative views about uh, uh, Muslims and science. With so care. There was one, uh, With one care. comment that I wanted to make, but I wanted to make another comment. I think the sort of attitudes, Elaine, that you were describing are potentially very dangerous in a uh, multi-ethnic, <laughs> multicultural, multi-religious society like the UK. So uh, I'm affiliated with King's College London. We have a very diverse student group uh, because uh, we're in London. And London is an extremely diverse place. We've got a lot of uh, students who do not come from Christian traditions. They come from Hindu traditions or Muslim traditions, whatever. And I, I think that uh, if scientists really do have this negative feeling about other religious traditions, this could harm the prospects of those students to feel at home in the academic environment and advance in their careers. And uh, in this connection, I note that studies have shown that uh, students from minority ethnic backgrounds do not advance as well or as far at university as they should do based on their pre-university uh, performance. And, and I wonder whether there's a connection here. Andy first. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment about my field in medicine. So um, I'm not saying we've solved this problem at all, but on various aspects of, of the, when we're setting up new processes and, and so forth, we bring in, we call them the users. So they're ex-patients, but they could be from any part of the community to come <coughs> in and comment on it. And one of the things I just wanted, was just going through my mind when I was listening to the discussion was that in our scientist training program, this is the STP, literally scientist training program for the whole country, we have, um, we have you know, um, users sit on the examination panels and, and probe the students and, and have opportunity to talk to students. So I'd like to think that you know, we're starting that process of, 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 of challenging the way people are trained and, and have various views come into that. Thank you. Andrew. Um, Abdul Salam, it's a, good, it's a good example, but it's perhaps a little bit uh, naive, I'm afraid, because his grave was desecrated in Pakistan, as he's regarded as a heretic uh, in that community. So um, I'd, I'd, it, would be a lovely, it would be a lovely example, but we've got to be very careful, and um, I'm afraid it's not quite a, such an easy story as I wish it was. Maybe we, we, we take that particular discussion then for yes. after the... Uh, evening tonight. I think there was a question all the way in the end of the casino. Yeah, please. Uh, it might not be a very clever question, but uh, the gentleman next to the gentleman in the blue shirt at the beginning, it's yourself. <laughs> you said that you believed in a creator. Did I, did I say that? I didn't. I don't. I don't remember saying. I do actually, but um, uh, <laughs> professionally as well. But um, I don't remember saying it. But but I, yes, I'm happy to accept. What I said. I, uh, oh right. Um, so the question I would like to know is, what sort of entity do you think that this creator is? Given that it could be a group of particles, wow. or wow. is it what? Humanity needs a creator to be. <laughs> wow, a fantastic question. What is God? That's a really important question. Mm -hmm. It's not whether God exists, it's what is God? 
Uh, even in North Korea, they believe in God. They worship him as Kim Il-sung and his successors. Um, so choosing what, making identification of God, that's the most important theological question. Uh, now, I studied the Greek philosophy. Aristotle says God is um, uh, eternal, God is living, uh, God is unchanging, things like that. Um, and philosophers can add many other attributes um, uh, in trying to articulate what God is. First cause, that which causes everything else without itself being caused, whatever that means. Um, Christianity has a particular answer, because we can't answer that question, um, that God has built a bridge between heaven and earth, and the bridge is called Jesus Christ. So you ask, what is God? God revealed is Jesus Christ. That's the Christian answer. Uh, other people have different answers, but that's my answer at the end of the day. Mike, any comments? Andrew do you agree with me? Uh, I do that's indeed. Good. I do oh, yeah. absolutely agree. It's <laughs> an so, Anglo Catholic dialogue. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, and I agree that at, at it's, the, it's, it's in a, to use a scientific term, it's the model that we have, really, of, of, of an, and our belief structure within that, really. Very much believe in a creator God, and very much believe uh, in the power of God through Jesus Christ, particularly for some of the things that we see within the world that we cannot understand and explain particularly actually seeing the power of prayer, and that's why I am where I am at the moment, really, as a priest as well. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we are reaching the end of the discussion. I guess time flies when you're having fun. I have one um, final important question to all of our panel members. We heard about the diversity of background, the, 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 a lot about the intersection between science and faith. Um, if there's one thing that you could change in the approach we take to either science or to faith, what would that one thing be that you change? Starting with Mike. I th I th I think we can feed from some of the discussion that we've had from the questions from the audience, and that would be to listen more to each other, to actually learn more from each other. The scientific communities that we've ha heard described actually gives you that opportunity, not just to come together to work on science, but actually c to come together from different cultures and backgrounds to learn from each other. And I think that's something that we can do within our own denominations, across denominations, between different spheres and worldviews and those that don't have a particular faith and look for that common ground, but listening more to each other and respecting each other. Very important, yeah. Andy? I could just say funding. <laughs> that tells you what I have to do most of my day. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I think, so I mean, I, I agree with Mike. So, you know, one of the beauties of what we do is, is we can explore, we can look at different facets of things and, and you know, bringing lots of different people and lots of different views into the equation help us really look for something different. So I think, what would I, what would I like to change? I think it's probably to get more inclusivity into the discussions so that we as scientists in whichever field we're working in, maybe we'll be challenged in a different way and might look, somebody made a comment about how valuable is something. You know, maybe we decide actually, you know, that's not the right direction to go in, but this would be even better. Kate? Um, yeah, I'm going to echo some of the discussion we had today. I really want, I really see science um, needs to turn to be more inclusive. At the moment, it's really quite, um, uh, to, to be able to do scientific research, it's really only open for a lot of rich countries. And so it shouldn't really be dependent um, on uh, your economic environment in the country. We need to have a more inclusive scientific community to bring in more uh, scientists from many different countries and of course within any of our countries we need to be more inclusive so I want science to really start more to, to reach out um, and try and become more diverse and try and to reach out to, to different audiences um, I think there's so many young people that would make incredible scientists and could do a lot in their communities and could do a lot with the scientific knowledge they learn if they were given that opportunity and it's really closed off and you can't see how it's closed off when you're in that inner circle and when you're given that kind of access. So that's the change I'd like to see. Andrew? I think it's an intellectual disease in science, um, particularly the last 50 years. It's, it's summed up in the phrase, shut up and calculate. 
Uh, those of you who work in science professionally will have heard this phrase, don't do that philosophy stuff, shut up and calculate, get off, build a new machine, smash more particles, new space telescope, whatever. But actually, I think a little bit more philosophy, good philosophy in science will make a big difference. Um, I'm a bit sad. I only studied philosophy when I started training to be a priest. I wish I'd done it 20 years earlier. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Alex? So something uh, related to what Andrew just said. Uh, speaking as a non-religious scientist, I think some non-religious scientists can be far too dismissive when thinking of faith. I think some scientists tend to take the view that perhaps science has sort of disproven the existence of God. And if you go back and look at what the scientific method, a concept that every scientist mm. should be familiar with, actually says... One of the things it says is that you should reach your conclusions through uh, rigorous observation and a healthy dose of scepticism, and that scepticism is a good thing, and it defines the lives of a lot of uh, scientists. But it also says that you should always try to prove the positive, never try, never try to prove the negative. You can prove things to be true, but disproving something is very, very difficult, and that includes disproving the existence of God. So if any non-religious scientist says that science has disproven the existence of God, they're not following the scientific method very closely, and they should probably be a bit more careful, in my opinion. Thanks, Alex. Sure. Elaine. I think the scientific community um, needs to recognize uh, areas of common ground with religious communities, that there has been um, too much othering um, and not enough recognition of common humanity and common human concerns. And religious communities, by and large, have done the same thing um, with science and with scientific communities, um, especially those communities in the, the UK and the US where the places where I have the most experience. I also think that um, science perhaps um, needs to acknowledge more of a, the sense of mystery um, that they have, and this is perhaps closer to what Andrew has said, that they um, often uh, make them sort of hold more closely to a sense of finitude, to a sense of um, the need to know everything in order to prove themselves different from religion, maybe then being accurate to what um, science really is in the process of science. Thank you. And John. Uh, okay, well, I guess you're kind of giving me the last word. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to give you one word, respect. Good yeah, a very, very good choice, John. Um, thank you very much to our <coughs> fantastic panel, who I think um, is owed a very big round of applause. I would like to thank you for joining us today for this interesting discussion where we explored many different dimensions across science um, and faith. Uh, a big thank you also for Liverpool Cathedral for hosting us in this amazing space. Uh, we would really appreciate if you could take just a minute or so to fill in the survey uh, that you find on your chairs. Keep the pen as a souvenir. Uh, that's a special gift from us, but it's really important from us to hear from you uh, what you felt about the discussion. So thanks again for joining us and hope to see you sometime very soon again.